Um, well, today is uh, Palm Sunday. Uh, this is the Sunday that Jesus came into Jerusalem uh, just before the crucifixion and the resurrection. And uh, from the Palm Sunday passage, Matthew chapter 21, verses 7 through 14, I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about a, a church that moved a city. A church that moved a city. Matthew chapter 21, verse number 7 through 14. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. Why don't we stand in honor of God's Word and uh, let's read uh, His Word. Matthew 21, 7 through 14. It says, They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Father, we thank you today for your word. We ask, God, that our hearts would be open. Father, we pray that you would use us this morning, Father. May your words, may my words be your words. And Father, we ask for your presence and for your anointing today. And Father, when we leave this church house, let it say it's been good to be in the house of God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, and God bless you, you may be reseated. Now, as Jesus entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, there was a great multitude of people that were following Jesus. There were hundreds of additional people in Jerusalem uh, because of Passover, they were celebrating Passover. Um, so the people, as they began to praise and wave uh, of the palm branches, it stirred a commotion in the community. Verse number 10 of that text, it says this, All the city was moved. All the city was moved. I mean, the, the, the city was shaken and put into a commotion and it, and it caused quite an uproar. Everyone took notice of, of him. I mean, people came running to see what the yelling was about, why they are putting their clothes down and waving their palm branches. Who is this that's causing such a stir uh, in the city? You see, their praise caused the city to be moved. Now, until the church is moved, the city won't be moved. The church has to be moved before the city will be moved. I mean, we can't expect revival to happen in our city before revival happens here. Peter said this in 1 Peter 4, 17. He said, For the time has come for judgment to begin. Where does it start? It starts at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what's that word? First, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So, so Peter is echoing the same sentiment that I'm talking to you about here today. See, revival has to start right here. It has to start with us. There has to be a, before there can be a commotion in our city, there has to be a commotion right here. 
Before there has to be a stirring in our community, there has to be a stirring right here. That has to happen. It, it has to start with us first. You know, we can't blame lukewarmness and carnality on the community. I mean, we have to blame the church. America needs revival. How many would you agree with that? But the church needs revival. Before America needs revival, the church needs revival. And revival must start in the church. It must start right here. You see, this message this morning is really a story about a church that moved the city. How many of you think we should get a little excited about Jesus to where it would cause a commotion to happen in our community? Now, as the, as the church was excited and it created this commotion, the people came running and they asked, who is this? The question that I have to ask us is, does our church impact our community? I mean, if we closed the door of our church, would our community miss us? Would they notice? Would people notice? Because d does our church really stir our community? Does our community even know that we're here? How does our church, how does our church move the city? How does it influence and impact other people and outsiders? Now, th this passage this morning tells us of some characteristics of a church that will influence its community. A church that will have a significant impact on its community. And I want to share with you this passage to me shares us some characteristics of a church that will influence its community. I want to share with you five characteristics this morning that will a church that will move a city, a church that will impact the city, a church that will cause a commotion. Five things this morning. Number one is this, a church that will move a city when number one, when that church is fully piloted by Jesus. When that church is fully piloted by Jesus. Look at verse number 7 and 8 of this text. It says, They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now in this text, there are two groups of people mentioned. We have the disciples, and then we, the Bible says we also have a very great multitude. It's not just a multitude, but it's a very great multitude. I told you there were extra people in Jerusalem because of the Passover. And so there was this multitude, a very great multitude of people. Now, the, this text here tells us what these, uh, the specifics of what these guys did, these two groups did. Verse 7 refers to what the disciples did, and then verse 8 refers to what the multitude did. And I, and I just want to point out today that these passages here point to the fact that it's telling us Jesus needs to be the pilot of the ship. How many know Jesus is the pilot of this of his thing called the church? Jesus needs to be the one that's in charge. You know what? I, I am the under shepherd, but the fact of the matter is Jesus is the shepherd, the true shepherd, the great shepherd. And he is the one that needs to pilot this ship. Now this these two verses here really show us the, the importance of saying, hey, Jesus wants to be the pilot or the ones that lead or guide uh, your life. Now we have here in verse number seven, some, the three things that the disciples did. They brought the donkey and the colt. They laid their clothes on them and then set him on them. These were three specific actions that the disciples did. Do you guys see that? They brought the donkey and the colt. That's an act of obedience, right? As, they, as Jesus said, this is what you're supposed to do. 
then they in turn obeyed what Jesus told them to do. I mean, you know, a true disciple of Jesus, somebody that's going to let him pilot their life is somebody who is obedient to what he asks them to do. And part of our job as a church is to discover it is, what is God asking us to do? And then in turn, let us be obedient to what he is asking us to do. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, obeying him is one of the high priorities, right? He says, they brought the donkey and the colt, then they laid their clothes on them. They laid their clothes on them, and then they set him on them. Those other two acts are, first of all, let me just mention the, the donkey. And I've preached on the donkey before many times at this point uh, because of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. But this was a fulfillment of prophecy found in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter number 9, verses 9 and 10, as a prophet prophesied that Jesus or your king, your Messiah would come into Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey or the youth or the youngness of a donkey. But we know this, donkeys, one of the characteristics uh, uh, that they have, they are known for what? Stubborn, right? Donkeys are known to be stubborn and kind of have a will of their own, correct? Now, they kind of have this reputation for being rude and ungovernable. So they brought the, the donkey and they brought the colt to Jesus to ride on as he entered into the city. I mean, you know, Jesus is the donkey whisperer. I mean, he has the power... He has the power to tame something that's been unbroken. Now the scripture, not here, but in in the other accounts of the gospel, say that he was not ridden on. So he was not tame. And sometimes that describes people, isn't it? That that people are unbroken. They They have a will of their own. They are stubborn. You know, the Bible even tells us this, that we like sheep even though we're compared to a sheep here, have what? Have what? Gone, uh, we've gone astray. What does that mean? We've gone our own way. We, like sheep, have gone our own way. And donkeys have this sense of being stubborn and have their own will. And until we can get to that point in our life where Jesus, where we can lay our garments on the beast and we can set him on that, and he has full reign, and he has full control of our lives, then we will not make an impact and move our city. Come on, somebody. I mean, what is he saying? He's saying if we are going to move our city, then we have to let Jesus have control of our life. We have to take our stubborn will, and we have to submit it to the trainer. We have to submit it to the, the one who can, who can tame our, ourselves. And so if you're here this morning, and listen, we, we wrestle with our will at times. I understand that even Jesus wrestled with his will in the Garden of Gethsemane. What did he? He, he? he knew what God's plan was for his life, but he also struggled with submitting to that because he knew how difficult and hard it would be. And Jesus is wrestling with his will and he tames his will, he, he disciplines his will, and he, and, he, and, he, and he crucifies it, and he submits it to the trainer. He submits it to the boss, and he says, Boss, I, I am going with your will, not my will. I don't want to do this if we don't have to, but I am submitting myself unto your will, and to your way. And until we get to that point in our life where we say, Jesus, you're the true pilot, Listen, you're you're the one that's taking the reins. You are the one that's giving me direction. You are the one that I am following. You are the one that I am submitting to. You are the one that I am laying my garments on. I am giving full and complete control to you. And that's what the Lord is saying to us through this passage. He is saying, listen, let's submit our stubbornness to His will. Let's submit ourselves." to him and let's give full reign and let's give full control to him. Psalms 81 verses 11 through 13 says this. It says, but my people would not heed my voice. 
and Israel would have none of me. God's people cannot, can, can come to a point where they don't listen to God's voice and they don't want Him. What does it say in verse 12? So I gave them over to their own, what's the word? Their own stubborn donkey heart, right? To walk in their own counsels. Verse 13, oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I'm telling you, just as the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul, he was like an unbroken donkey doing his own thing, persecuting Christians. He was on his way to Damascus, persecuting Christians when, when he had this blinding encounter with Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, verse number 4 through 6, look at this encounter. It says, Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's pretty bad when God has to introduce himself to you, right? When you don't know who he is, that he has to say, I am Jesus. But notice that next phrase. What does it say? It is hard for you to what? Kick against the goads, goads. The goad was kind of like a, a, a stick with a pointed piece of iron on its tip used to prod the oxen when they were plowing. You know, when, you don't, when they don't want to go, they get, wham, ow! You lift it, you know. The farmer would, you know, prick them, and this animal, in order to steer them in the right direction. And sometimes the animal, what they would do was that they would kick against that goad. They would kick against that prick. That's what he is saying. And sometimes God pricks us or God, and that's what he's saying here to the Apostle Paul. It's hard for you. Listen, I'm trying to put you in the right direction, Saul. I'm trying for you to go in this direction. But why are you kicking against the pricks? Why are you kicking against the goads? Why are you kicking against that? Look at the following verse. Did I have the next verse up there, Taylor? So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So here we have the Lord is trying to tell Saul. He's trying to tame Saul is what he's trying to do, isn't he? He's trying to get him to submit to, the, 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 let him be the pilot of his life. Saul, you're running your own life. You think you're working for God, but you're really not working for God. And I'm trying to give you direction here. And stop kicking against those pricks. Stop doing that. I'll tell you what to do. I'll, 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 I'll tame you. I'll show you what to do. So are we a broken donkey? Have we allowed Jesus to pilot us? Have we relinquished the control to Him? Do we trust Him or are we stubborn? Doing our own thing. How about let's trust the trainer, and let's submit to him. How I many you know we're going to save ourselves a lot of pain and a lot of heartache and a lot of prodding if we just surrender to him? How I many you know Jesus wants us to submit to him and allow us to sit upon, Jesus wants to sit upon our lives and he wants to control us and he, we want to be directed by him and let's give him the reins and let's give him the control. Let's let him tell us where he wants us to go. Or do we buck and do we rebel? Do we want to do our own thing and go our own way? Folks, we, our church won't move a city until we let him control us, pilot us. I notice here I need to move on. But I want you to notice the two donkeys that were there. Matthew's account is the only gospel that mentions two donkeys. The other ones mention one. It doesn't mean that there's a, a problem with... It just, means, it just means that they mentioned 
You know, if Josh and I went and, or Mark and Josh and I watched the Purdue game the other day and Mark and I ate pizza, but Josh didn't, and I just said me and Mark went and ate pizza, the, uh, had pizza watching the game the other day, it doesn't mean that Josh wasn't there, right? Just that I mentioned that, I, that I, Mark and I ate pizza. So he is, but I want you to know there's some significance to this, that there's a young, there's a donkey and there's a colt. Colt is that foul or young or youth. And uh, the Bible mentioned to it, which is saying that he's never been ridden on. He was a baby. He was a baby enough. He was probably the same size as the other donkey, but it was just a young, a young donkey. So both of these donkeys are present here as they, as they rode over to the Mountain of Olives in Jerusalem. So it was probably a female nursing donkey with her colt. And uh, it really talks to us something here about, about our discipleship. First of all is this, that I think God wants to use the younger generation. Do you see that, that sometimes that God wants to use the younger generation? And I'm telling you, we need to, the church, if we, don't, if we don't allow God to use and work with the younger generation, by the time that the church gets up to this age, then the church is going to be extinct. We have to pass on this Pentecostal baton to the generation underneath us. And as a church, we need to really massage and work and try to get the millennials and get those people underneath us so that God can work and encounter with that generation. It also talks to us about the importance of, well, what does that mean for us older generations? No, it doesn't mean that we disregard that generation. It really talks to us about the importance of the mentorship of the older generation. I mean, we need, we need the old donkey. I, don't mean, I mean that in a negative way. I mean, I just the older donkey. We need the older donkey to come alongside the younger generation and work together and bring mentorship uh, uh, to, to that younger generation. I'm telling you, it talks to us really about the importance of baby Christianity, having someone help us as we grow. How many of you think that younger generation, baby Christians need a mother, they need a father to help them to grow up, to help them grow, to learn what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen to that. Now I want you to notice they didn't have a saddle, right? So the saddle was they took their clothes off, their garments. The disciples laid the garment across the saddle because you know we, we really as followers of Christ, if we want him to pilot us, we have to be obedient to him to do what he tells us to do. But we also have to shed our outer garments. We have to shed our fleshly garments. We have to shed the sinfulness and we have to lay it at Jesus' feet and we have to let him. And then secondly, we see that they set him on the donkey. They are the ones that set him. They gave him. How many of you know Jesus is just not going to jump on your donkey unless you ask him and you set him there? We have to ask him to come into our heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's not going to break in until we open the door and let him come in. And we have to set him. How many of you know we need Jesus to pilot this ship? I need Jesus to pilot my life. I give him full and complete control. Number two, the second way that a church will stir a city is, is when the church gets passionate about Jesus. Not only do we let him pilot our life, but we get passionate about him. Verse number nine, you know the story. The, the, the people took the palm branches, right? And they, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, they, and they began to wave them. In fact, the scripture says that they laid them in his path. Let's look at verse number nine. It says, then the multitudes who went before and those who followed, so picture this, so Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and there's multitudes, very great multitudes that are going before him and there are multitudes that are following behind him. And so Jesus is surrounded by this multitude of people and as they are going, they are crying out. I mean, there's some passion in their voice. I tell you what, I think the church, we've lost our passion for God. We've lost, when's the last time we've cried out? When's the last time that we, we have desperate? How, you know what? Desperation and hunger and passion. I, God will meet us at our level of hunger. And I think in the church world, we've lost our hunger or we've lost our appetite. And we've lost it. Our desire and our appetite has been suppressed by many things of this world. The things of this world perhaps has suppressed our hunger and our passion and our desire for God. Would anybody agree with me on that? 
you know, what happened to that day where we, we would say, God, I value you more than anything else. God, I, I relish you. I relic you. You are more important to me than anything else. And, and you know what? It, it's a sad day when we can come into the church and it's even hard to get people to worship God. You know what? You, you feel like you have to do a stirring. Why? Because there, there is a point where the, the church has, has, has become so worldly that we, when we come into a very presence of God, we have to push past all the other stuff to even find the hunger for it. Come on, I'm, I'm preaching right now. But I'm saying, folks, we're not, we're, you know, passion is contagious, isn't it? And if we're, going to, if we're going to stir the community, then I think the church has to get stirred first. Revival has to start here. Revival has to start with us. We have to get passionate before God. The scripture there says that they began to cry out, singing Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And folks, as, as the people of God began to be submissive and let Jesus pilot them, and as they let their passion and their, their exuberation begin to show, it caused a stirring within the community. It caused, what's this, what's going on, right? And so, and I just want to encourage us, folks, we need to rekindle a passion for God. You know, we need to come into the place where we come to the very presence of God through a time of worship where we just abandon ourselves before Him. You know, we become like the woman, right, who, 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 laid, who, who wept at Jesus' feet, who dried, and cried and wet and washed His feet with her tears and her brokenness because she was so appreciative of what God had done for her, of what Jesus had done for her. And, and Jesus goes to them, and there were people that were indignant, saying, man, don't, if you knew who she was and what she did, listen, you, you shouldn't allow that to happen. And then Jesus goes in and gives them a little lesson on passion. He's saying, for those that have been forgiven of much, they love much. But if you've been forgiven of little, then you love little. In other words, let me t show you a little bit about passion. If you've been forgiven of a lot, you understand that, that you were a sinner and you were bound to heaven or bound to hell. But Jesus, by his grace, has come and washed you and made you new and clean. He said, man, you're going to appreciate him and you're going to worship just like that woman worshiped. It is because, you know, she understood the depth of the grace of God. She understood the depth of her forgiveness. And folks, I just wonder if we, we have forgotten what he has done for us, that we have forgotten that we were sinners bound for hell. The wrath of God was against us, but Jesus, through his grace and his mercy, interceded, intercepted, and stepped in the way and became the mediator and pushed the wrath of God. And now the wrath of God is subsided or it's blocked against us because Jesus is the one that finds atonement for our sins. And folks, if, if we realize what he has done for us, then when it comes to worship, we'll worship him more because we've been forgiven of a lot. Their worship here, it says, Hosanna to the son of David. Notice what they're saying, Hosanna is saved now. We, they're saying, you know, our, we're safe now. We are safe now. Hosanna is, saves us. We are safe to the son of David. Son of David was a sign of messianic or saying that this is the lineage of David. This is the one we are looking for to come to save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He has come to us at our time. He has come right now. Can you imagine that, folks? Jesus came to them and they said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And folks, that's what needs to happen. I tell you what, nothing will captivate the community more is they when they see a bunch of people that are so excited about Jesus and they love Jesus and they are passionate for Jesus and they are excited about Jesus. I'm telling you what, that will get people's attention, somebody. Come on. That, that will get somebody's attention when we are so excited because we realize what Jesus has done for us. Number three, number three is this. I mean, Jesus said this, uh, they said this about Jesus, zeal for my house has consumed me. They realized that Jesus had a passion for the house of God, right? 
That's when Jesus went into the temple and he overturned the tables and then this scripture thought came to their mind, a zeal for my house consumes me or it has eaten me up. In other words, Jesus was passionate about the house of God that it caused other people to take notice of the passion that he had for the house of God. We should be passionate for him. Third thing is this. If we want to stir our community... Number one is when we begin to let him pilot. We let him pilot. Jesus is the pilot. When when the church says, Jesus, take over. Number two is when we are passionate. When we we get excited about Jesus. And number three is when the, the church begins to promote Jesus. Verse number 10 through 11. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, what did they ask? Who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The question was, their praise and their passion, their exuberance, their commotion, stirred the community. I mean, there was such a a commotion in their community, it created a curiosity that everyone in the community had to come to find out what's going on. And it raised this question, who is this? Our praise should be so passionate that it would cause others to ask, Why are you guys making such a big to-do about this person? Now, there were varying responses to who Jesus was in this crowd. First of all, there were people who didn't know who Jesus was at all. They were unaware of what God has done for them. Even the Holy One is unknown in the holy city. In Jerusalem, there were people that didn't know who Jesus was. Even though they are unaware, it doesn't mean they're they're not inquisitive. Because how many of you know there are people right here in our community that don't know who Jesus is? There are people that are sitting here that don't understand what God the Father has done for them. They are oblivious to the gospel. They are oblivious to the price that Jesus paid for their sins. They are oblivious to the good news of salvation found in Jesus Christ. There are people that are just going about doing their duty, doing their activities, that they think that their purpose in life is to do whatever they're supposed to be doing, completely unaware of what the, what Jesus, who Jesus is. And how many of you know that that's the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church is to go into all the world and to what? Preach the gospel. The part of our mission as a church is to preach the message to those people who are unaware of that message, are unaware of what Jesus has done, that God the Father gave His only begotten Son to die for us, that to, to give His life, and if we believe on Him, if we receive Him, then we are forgiven and we are made new and our ha- name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and we have eternal life. That's the message. And folks, that's what the church of Jesus Christ, that's what Kirk 
Upland Assembly of God needs to promote, doesn't it? It needs to say, hey folks, listen, Jesus is still the way. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the way. He is the door. In fact, the only access to coming into the kingdom of God is you got to go through the door. And you can't jump over the fence. You can't come in the back door. There are no trap doors, folks. There's only one door to get access into the kingdom of God, and it's found through His Son, Jesus Christ. And folks, if you're listening here this morning, whether it's by camera or Facebook, I want to let you know that Jesus died for you, and you have to receive and believe Him. The good news is this, is that Jesus died for you and for your sins, and if you walk through that door, you have access to Him today. And that's what we want to tell you today. Jesus is the way. Now there are some people also in that crowd. The crowd that said this. They claim to know a little bit about Jesus. Look at verse 11. The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. It's kind of yes and no, right? Yes, he is a prophet. In fact, as Jesus is concerned about what people think of him. What are, what are his people's viewpoints of him? In fact, he asked the disciples, did he not? He said, who do people say that I am? And what, what did Peter say? Peter said, well, you know, here's, here's some people. Some of you think that you're Elijah the prophet. Some of you think that you're John the Baptist. Some of you think, think that. And see, that's what he's saying. Is some people, what, they think that Jesus was a historical figure. He is a historical figure. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. They say that he was a prophet. They say that he was these things. He, and, and you're right, he was these things. But he is so much more than a rabbi. He is so much more than a prophet. I'm telling you, he is the son of God. He is God's son, the only begotten of the Father. God the Father gave himself to us. Jesus came as God's son, and he claimed to be God's son. And he, and he, and he, is, he is the savior of the world. He is so much more than just a prophet. And as, 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 uh, as Jesus talked to Peter, he said, yes, I see what the world says, but I want to ask you this, Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, I believe you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Right answer, Peter. Ding, 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 ding. Right answer. It does matter what we believe about Jesus. Because it's God's plan of salvation. And there's no other ulterior plan. It's sufficient. Jesus was sufficient to settle God's wrath on our life. Then there were those in the crowd also who say, oh, he's our political leader to save us from the Roman rule. And then there were those who claim that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior. He is divinity. He is the third person of the Trinity. Now there was a pharisaical class that was moved with envy and indignation that Jesus would come and claim to be the Son of God. Blasphemy, they would say. There were many different claims to be who, who, who claimed to be who Jesus is. You know, even, even that whole as Jesus revealed himself, or Nicodemus came to Jesus, who was a part of that Pharisee, uh, a ruler of the Jew, of the Sanhedrin. You know, there, there were people that were of the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees that, that even though that they obviously were there, uh, but they, they also were inclined to figure out who he actually was. Because as he came to Jesus, he said, man, I realize that you're a teacher, Rabbi, that has come from God because of these signs that you do. And, and so Jesus comes to him, and, and he begins to say to this Pharisaic leader, he says, and he begins to say, hey, listen, you've got to be born again. And he begins to talk about the, the importance of the Spirit's rework and regeneration. Spirit, you've got to be born again, not literally, but or physically, but spiritually, you got to be born again. God wants to make us new, doesn't he? He wants to make all things new. 
and make us new. And, and he said, listen, I, I'm having a hard time understanding this. You know, I'm having a hard time. How can he go back into a mother's womb the second time? And, and Jesus says to this to Nicodemus about, about the Spirit's work as he began to unveil that to him. And he said, how can this be? And John, Jesus said this, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? It's a sad day when we have teachers and pastors and spiritual leaders that can't even explain the very, the very, you know, they can talk about the religious things and the things of religion, but they can't talk about the practicalities of salvation. They can't talk about, they don't understand how that works. And, and folks, and that's what needs to happen is there needs to be some leaders and pastors and, and apostles and, and evangelists that, that understand the work of God, that understand how it works and and, 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 can, and can speak that to people. See, guys, but our job is to promote Jesus. Our job is to, when the world questions us about who this Jesus is, our job is to have the answers and to say, listen, let me introduce you to who this Jesus is. Let me explain to you what he has done. Let me explain to you how he has saved me, how he has changed me, how I've been born again, how I've, how I've been twice born, how I have experienced not only a, a physical birth, but I've experienced a spiritual birth, that I've been changed. And that's what we got to explain it to people. And so when people come with questions, that we can have the answers to give them so that they can come to experience and know who God is. Jesus said this, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Our job is to hold up a banner to this world that says Jesus is the answer. And we're going to promote him. He is the solution. A church that will move the city will promote Jesus. Fourthly, a church that will move a city is, is when the church is purified by Jesus. It's purified by Jesus. Verse number 12 and 13. In our text this morning, we took us past, past the, 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 uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus, and we step now into Jesus going into the temple what was the first thing that he did as he entered into that city? What was the first thing that he did? He went straight to the house of God. When he went there, he went right there because why? Reformation of the church. This is a reformation of the, this is a reforming of the church because the church had become something that it should not have been. And Jesus is saying, listen, I've got to clean up this church. I've got to help clean up the church because it's doing something that it has not designed and been created it for, for it to do. So there has to be a church reformation. There has to be something to change within the church. And so what, what happens here is the first place that we find him as he goes to Jerusalem is not in somebody's house, is not in the inner entertainment movie theater what he does is he goes to the church because Jesus has a priority for the temple he has a heart and a passion for the house of God he sets the example for us by by coming to the house of God by having diligent attendance to the to to the religious assemblies and coming to the house of God and Jesus kept the Passover yearly on a basis ever since he, he was a young boy, 12 years old, coming to the house of God. And, and how many know he set the example for that? And that's what we need to do is keep the house church attendance as a priority within our lives. But his purpose for coming to, the, to Jerusalem was to go to the church. Part of it was to go to the church. And, and before, uh, before his purpose to coming into the world was really to reform, to reform the world but before he could reform the world, he had to reform the judgment starts at the house of God. Reformation starts here. Change starts here. You see, before a city can be moved and stirred, the church has to be moved and the church has to be stirred. And there's nothing like Jesus to go in and create a commotion within that temple. Throw some money changers over. Grab a whip and wham! I'm going to tell you what, there's a commotion that's starting there in the house of God. In fact, that's why he got crucified, wasn't it? It created a commotion with those Pharisaic religious leaders. 
See, Reformation starts as he came to the temple. He began to found, he found that there was corruption in the church. He had found that it was not in a good condition. It wasn't in a good place. There were money changers. There were marketplaces. There were oxen and sheep being sold and does for sacrifices for the conveniences of those who at far distances could not bring to their own sacrifices. And they had money changers that sold them for filthy lucre. I mean, a lot of times, a lot of sin issues can go be directed back to money issues where people are in it for profit and people are in it for making of money. And, and that's where corruption starts in the church is when we, we owe a lot of a rise to love for money. But I'm telling you, Jesus is coming back for a church that is without spot or wrinkle. Jesus is coming back for a pure bride and a pure church. And so what Jesus had to do is Jesus had to purify the church. He had to purge the church. He made a whip. He drove them all out of the temple. He poured out the money from the money changers. He overturned the tables. He spoke those two who had said that. And he said, guys, listen, let's not make this. You've made it to a house of merchandise, a marketplace for people to make money when my house should be a house of prayer. Jesus has come to purify the church. How many you know he's the great refiner? He refines us. He purifies the church. He purifies the bride. Listen, he died for us. His, don't let his death be in vain. Don't let him, the, the price that he paid, giving his very life, the blood, sweat, the tears, his life, his breath, he gave everything for us. Let's not let sin stop that. He cleanses us. And lastly, the fifth one is when the church will stir the city, is when, fourthly, is we will let him purify us. Purify the church. Bring change to the church. And then lastly is when we let, next point, Taylor, pattern Jesus. When we start to pattern him, then we're going to start Stirring our community. Verse number 14, it says this. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple. And what did he do? How many times did people come to the church and they did not receive what they needed because the church was something that had become that it shouldn't have been? When Jesus purifies it, what does he do? He meets the needs of people. Our church will stir this community when we start meeting the needs of people. Whether it's a physical need or food pantries, helping the homeless, shelters, community cleanups, community cookouts, fun for events, nursing home help, free practical help, whatever the needs are. And if we start meeting those needs, I'm telling you what, it's going to stir the community. Let's stand to our feet this morning. I've got to stop. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem caused quite a stir, caused quite a commotion, and it stirred the city. You see, the, the city will be stirred when we get stirred. Revival will come to our city when revival comes to us. And it starts with the church. And we need to be stirred so that our, we can influence our community. Will our city miss the church if we close the doors? See, we can only be stirred, we can stir a city only when we've been stirred by God. And we can do that with five ways. When we lit, when we, when we are piloted by Jesus. When we, are, we, we surrender our stubborn wills and give him complete control and reign. We'll stir a city when we get passionate for Jesus. When we begin to praise him with fervency. We realize what he has done for us. And we come with passion. 
will stir the city when we promote Jesus. When we lift up the banner that says Jesus is the way, when others are saying, who is this that you're talking about, then we can point them to who Jesus is. We'll stir the city when there's reformation that happens within the church, when he purifies the church, when he cleanses the temple. And by the way, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. We'll stir the city when we, are, when we pattern him. We live like him, and then we also meet the needs of other people today. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, there needs to be a stirring within this church. God, there needs to be a stirring within this preacher this morning. Father, I come today to pray. God, that you would begin to do a work deep within my heart, within my life. Father, I come today, and I, I, God, we readily admit that the house of God has become something that it shouldn't be. And so, Father, we pray that there would be a reformation, a church reformation. We pray, Father, that there would be a change. We pray, Father, that you would come in and